Today's guest is, uh, has been here a couple times. You may have seen Mark here once or twice. He is the historical research editor at Army Aviation Magazine and is a longtime member of the United States Naval Institute. In addition, he teaches history at Norwalk Community College. In May 2005, he was presented with a General Assembly citation by both houses of the state legislator in Hartford for his efforts in commemorating the centennial of Battleship Connecticut. Please join me in welcoming back to the library, Mark Albertson. Thank you, good afternoon. Good afternoon. Mark, and it is a good afternoon, it really is a nice day outside. Thank you. Uh, this is a, uh, a series, a four talk set on the military industrial complex. And, oh, by the way, this will be followed at the end of November by another four talk set on the Cold, by, on the Cold War. Uh, but this, this series here is about that, that phenomenon known as a military industrial complex and how societies organize themselves for war, uh, particularly in the modern era. Uh, if, if you look at world, what you call World War I, World War II, most of you, uh, some of you at least who have uh, attended my talks before, some of my classes at North Community College, uh, know I do not hold to World War I and World War II. There's only one war, and it's the Great War, 1914-1918, a 21-year hiatus, 1939-1945. You can't have one without the other, and that's going to that's going to come up later on here, uh, because of the military-industrial complexes of the United States and the Soviet Union. And you're going to see that uh, the Soviet industrial capacity, what you call World War II is one of the Allies' biggest secrets for victory in the Second World War. They are going to do this largely on their own. They are going to win the greatest land war in history virtually on their own. Len Lease was less than 10% of the Soviet effort. They're going to do this largely on their own. Why? Uh, as you'll see next week, because Mr. Stalin had the foresight to understand that Versailles is the biggest hoax ever perpetrated on modern man, and he's going to be ready for it. Basically what you're seeing here. But to get to the start of this, how, how did we get to this point, this, this thing called the military-industrial complex? Uh, well, let's go back to the Great French War. And again, people who have attended my earlier lectures understand the Great French War is actually two parts. The French Revolutionary War, 1792 to 1802, and the Napoleonic conflicts, 1803-1815. This is 23 and a half years of war. 23 and a half years. However, you see here with the opening of the French Revolution, 1789, uh, these ideas, they, these ideas do not originate here, but they're unleashed. In this, in this revolution, the ideas of liberalism, democracy, socialism, secularism, nationalism, parliamentarianism. Uh, I mean, these ideas are actually at odds with what exists in Europe. The regal system of rule, the monarchs, the last thing they want is people being able to determine their own fate. You think, they're, you think they like that? Not on your life. But this is an era, folks, where the, where the Industrial Revolution is beginning to snowball. Not beginning, it is, it's snowballing. Capitalism is evolving. You know, you're, the, the, the idea of serfdom is dying. It's not going to be abolished in Russia until 1861. But it's dying here, you know, and as capitalism evolves, and as factories are built, uh, don't you need more wage earners for that? Aren't some people making a little money doing this? Does that make them more mobile? You're creating a middle class. And then you're going to have your new clique of rich, which is going to displace the nobility and undermine the monarchs all through the 19th century. It's one of the reasons you're going to have the First World War in 1914, or what you call the First World War. But you see here, during the Great French War, you know, and, you know, as these monarchs want to kill these ideas unleashed by the French Revolution in the womb, well, you know, the, the French are going to have to fight. It's not too unlike what the Russians are going to have to go through in 1919 when Poland, this newly minted Poland, decides to attack, to attack fledgling Bolshevik Russia. And the revolution's threatened, and the people are going to flock to defend the revolution. France was no different. And in the beginning, as the Austrians and the Dutch 
the French are going to revolt. The French are going to fight against this. But as you see here, the, the days of relying on professional soldiers and volunteers is fast coming to an end. And as, again, there are more factories, what does that mean? More weapons? If there's more factories? You know, these, these ideas of these armorers building guns on an individual basis is fast receding. You know, production, assembly line production is coming. How about interchangeable gun parts? There's a boom to weaponry. And as more weapons are produced, what does technology do? Doesn't technology evolve? Look at that little cell, look at that little phone you're carrying. I mean, what, what could that phone do 15, 20 years ago? Make a call across town? Or make a, make a call from here to California? Now you can order toilet paper on this thing. <laughs> I mean, this is where we've gone. And aren't they even smaller now? Yes, they are. And can't they do more than they did 15 years ago? I mean, isn't, isn't that a mini computer now? Or, uh, for, all, for all intents and purposes. I mean, I've seen people reading Kindle, so on and so forth. I mean, it's fascinating what's happened with technology. Weaponry, the same thing. Weaponry, the same thing. I mean, go back to the Great French War, and you see what? They're still using single-shot muskets, but they can make more of them. But then again, go to 1914 and take the French. You know, when the French get into the First World War, some of these guys are still wearing these, these wonderful and colorful red, white, and blue uniforms. And they're still advancing in Napoleonic fashion. Only instead of 1815, this is 1914. And what do you think German machine gunners are doing here? Yeah, shooting them is right. You know, the, the, the profligacy in human life is astounding as you go on here. You know, I stumbled on a statistic last week. And again, that, that really rams home what this series is going to be about. In 1920, you know, not all the British war dead came home. Many were buried in France. Perhaps some of you people have been to Europe. You've been to these, uh, these cemeteries. It's interesting how peop some people make money off of, off of war, modern war in particular. Again, you know, the, the broadening of war here and how it affects society, that's going to come out of this too. But in 1920 to 1933, uh, burying the British war dead, this is just the British, this doesn't count the French or the Americans or even the Germans for that matter who fell in France. The British, every week for, for between, between 1920 and 1923, 4,000 tombstones a week were going to France. That's a week. That's 16,000 a month. Do the math. Wow. You know, one battle in world, I think it was Eras in 1915. In four days, the British were losing 3,266 men an hour. This is modern war. And you see this coming out of the Great French War. And it's estimated by some military historians that upwards in this 23 and a half year conflict, six and a half million Europeans will be dead in this war. I mean, it involves all of you, the French, the, Aust the Austrians, uh, the British will get involved, the Dutch, the Belgians, Tsarist Russia, Prussia, there's no Germany, Prussia, no Germany at this point. The Poles are gonna join the French because they're hoping to get territory. Territory they're not gonna get at this stage. But, so it's interesting what you see here, developing here, as man uses his te technology and makes it to war. It's astounding here. United States, 1791, Alexander Hamilton, report on the manufacturers. You know, there is that, there is that, uh, I won't say competition, there is a difference of opinion here. Uh, Mr. Jefferson was a, a so-called agrarian, where was he from? South? Alexander Hamilton is more toward industrializing America. Report on the manufacturers. Interesting what he, interesting here. Uh, arms. Creating a domestic arms industry so we're not beholden to foreigners. But having it so-called government control. This is where you're going to begin to see, uh, in, as the years roll on here, the arsenal spring up. Keep in mind here, it is, it is the, these arsenals which are going to produce the arms. You know, we haven't gotten into Lockheed and Boeing yet at this stage. But you see the progression starting. It's fascinating. Eli Whitney, remember him? Yeah. 
wants to have assembly line type production for arms. He says we can make 10,000 to 15,000 muskets a year. This is even prior to the War of 1812. And so you see the ideas being fashioned here. Capitalism, the Industrial Revolution, and the idea of, of, of creating more arms, which necessitates what? Well, we're going to need more bodies here. We're going to need more bodies. So you see this come out of the Great French War. And is it going to alter society? Yes, irrevocably so. But then there's this idea of the South, the Confederacy. I mean, we're all enamored with the, the plantation owner and the slaves and so on and so forth. Remember that thing called states' rights? I mean, what you're creating here is really a slaveocracy. Wasn't the southern economy, uh, for quite a bit of the southern economy, underpinned by free labor? We'll call it free labor if you want to call it that. And wasn't the plantation owner the top of the heap in the social hierarchy here? Mm -hmm. You know, it's interesting when you come out of the American Revolution, the idea here, uh, they kick that can down the road. Of course, they're building a country. They want the North and the South together. Is it a problem? Yeah, of course, even George, George Washington and Martha had in their wills that when they're gone, their, sla their slaves are to be free. Even Thomas Jefferson uh, said that this, this institution was going to last long, but they're not really doing anything about it at this point. Something will be done about it in 1861 when the Civil War starts. But you know, some of that is this growing industrialization of America. Because what you're going to see after the Civil War is absolutely astounding. We have 144,000 factories or centers of production in this country in 1865. We will have 335,000 by 1900. Does that take wage earners? Yes. Does that mean the end of things like slavery? Well, in, in that fashion, perhaps. America's being, America's being refashioned here. It's undergoing an evolution. But you see here with the Southerners, you know, this idea of states' rights. Well, where does this come from? This was supposed to be an underpinning of the Confederacy, right? States' rights. Actually, go back to, go back to when the federal, uh, John Adams, well, John Adams was a, was a Federalist. He was president. And what do you see here? The Alien and the Sedition Acts. People like Thomas Jefferson didn't trust the Supreme Court to have a balanced view of this. So he's going to try to pass a couple of resolutions. And Kentucky's going to pick up on this. Interesting how they interpret this. The idea, Jefferson's idea, it wasn't secession. Jefferson's idea here is if I don't trust the Supreme Court, Maybe we get weights from the, the weight from the states, a number of states, to repeal these acts. But when you get to this, you get this, these real southerners, these real southern states writers. No, you know the. It, it's interesting here what comes out of this. The idea here is the Constitution is a compact. Oh, well, is, isn't that some of what it is? Compact. These agree. These states agree to ratify the Constitution, right? Now they're all part of this one country called the United States. But there is such a thing as states' rights. Doesn't that go back in some way to the Tenth Amendment of the Constitution? What's not covered in the Constitution or the Bill of Rights is what? Covered by the states? And how the people individually in these states are going to run their state? Could that lead to an issue? Yeah, it could. Isn't that why you have the courts? If the people themselves can't solve these issues? No. If, the, if, the, if there's a law, a law or resolution that perhaps the state doesn't like, secede from the union. to see from the Union. Is that originally how the country is really put together? No, it's not. No, it's not. And as you... Now, another one here is John C. Calhoun. I know they're taking his name off the buildings up the line here. Yeah, no, okay, well. But Calhoun, despite being an ardent Southerner, was also a nationalist. He was a nationalist. I mean, did he cater to the idea of Southernism? Of course he did. But he was also a nationalist. Of course, some of these Southern rabble-rousers who will follow him, like Robert Barnwell Rett, uh, William Lowndes Yancey, Edmund Ruffin, who are real, and I mean real, firebrands of Southernism. 
They're going to take this and run with it in the 1850s. But you see beforehand, uh, Mr. Calhoun, uh, again, ardent Southerner, but also a nationalist. Of course, things are going to change with, 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 with initiatives like the Missouri Compromise of 1820. Because at this point, the Southerners are seeing that they are having less, import, less, less importance in councils in Washington. And as more states come into the Union, there is that fear that most of these states, if not all, will eventually become what? Free states? What's going to happen to slavery? And their, and, their, and their fear is if the northern politicians can allow most or all these states to become free states, if they can stop the expansion of the southern economy or slavery, will they eventually try to stop that in Charleston? Yes. Yes. Would you explain what you mean that Calhoun is a nationalist? Well, he was um, at one point Secretary of War. He was a Vice President of the United States. He did not want to see the Union broken up. But he wanted That's basically to... what I want to mention as being a nationalist. He was, he was an ardent Southerner, but he did not want to see the nation broken up. That's not what he wanted to see. But the people who will come along after him have a different outlook on states' rights. In fact, Mr. Calhoun is the one who's going to think that with regards to states' rights, if a law or resolution is passed that the state doesn't like it, just don't pay attention to it or do away with it on a local level. But don't break up the country. But again, there's going to be some who follow we're going to take this to the next level. And you get to this when you see the, the nullification of 1828 and 1832, or the tariff of abominations. Now, as the, as, the, as the North and South are progressing here, the North is the industrialized area of the country. I mean, it seems like they're taking... Alexander Hamilton's idea and running with it. Whereas the South seems like it's receding back in time here. This so-called, as some historians have put it, and it's a way of it's, it's a it's a way of describing what, what's becoming what's becoming what's happening in the South, the Southern aristocracy, the plantation owners. I mean, keep in mind, you know, by the time the Civil War starts, uh, less than 25% of Southerners own slaves. Most don't. The plantation owners do. But most folks don't own slaves. Although you even had slavery for a while up here in the north. Of course, up here, slavery was where, you know, people like yourselves, you live in a house, you might have one, maybe two living with you. Cleaning the house, taking care of the kitchen, watching the kids. You didn't have 30, 40, 50 picking the cotton out in the backyard. That didn't exist here. It does down south. Of course, truth be told, it was, was, was slavery uh, a, a, a uh, reprehensible form of bondage? Yeah, but it was even worse in the islands. It was even worse in the islands. These Africans brought to the Caribbean and, and, and down in South America, I mean, that environment ate these people like peanuts. And there was that constant, I mean, these shippers were making a lot of money. Bringing, it was interesting how, how it worked. You know, you, you get a bunch of traders picking up slaves, black slaves and blacks in Africa, bringing them over here, dropping them off, getting paid for that, and then carrying freight to England so the trip to England was paid. Or Holland, and then going south to pick up more slaves, and then, you know, it's a triangle. I know, because I used to work with a guy years ago, this guy John Edson, he was in the Merchant Marine. I said, boy, the apple sure didn't fall far from the tree. He says, yeah, he says, he says I have a he says, I have a, a, a relative uh, from the Revolutionary War, before the Revolutionary War era, who brought slaves here. And he says, every once in a while we have family gatherings. He is a topic for discussion. <laughs> Interesting. Interesting. It's absolutely fascinating. I mean, history from the ground like this. But you see here, the Southerners are worried. Sure, we'll enact these tariffs to keep European goods out to protect the Northerners, but what else are we exporting by we the Southerners? Cotton, tobacco, uh, rice, maybe sugar? How many products do we have as opposed to the industrialized North? And since that's the case, if you're going to enact tariffs for goods coming from Europe to protect the Northern producers, what do you think the Europeans are going to do with our goods? 
Yeah, tariff is right. Tariff wars, remember that? Yeah, yeah. And so the idea grows here, and South Carolina will take the lead. Well, okay, then if that's the case, then we can secede from the Union. And, you know, a Andy Jackson, that's, wasn't he a Southerner? Tennessee, right? Tennessee, right. Yeah. Now, I always wonder what Andy Jackson would have done with the Bundys out in Oregon. <laughs> I don't think that would have lasted long. Uh, he says, no, you don't secede. That's not how this country was formed. If you want something changed that you don't like that was passed, don't you go through your elected officials to try to get it changed? Isn't that what the American Republic is supposed to be? Of course it is. If something is passed in Congress and you don't like it, you call Jim up. Hey, I don't like this. This is, I don't know, violates the Ninth Amendment or whatever the case may be. Change it. Well, then maybe if he agrees with you, he'll try to get other congressmen on board and they'll change it. That's, that's, the, that's, that's the tact you can take here. Not seceding. Of course, keep in mind, the Southerners are be, feel like they're being closed in. You know, you are going beyond what, what John C. Calhoun was, was, was looking to do, as opposed to, again, the, the, growing, the growing aspect of the radical nature of Southernism. And he's going to say, no, you go through Congress. That's how this works. Oh, and by the way, if you think you're leaving, I'm going to hang you from the highest tree. <laughs> That's what he said in, in language or, or, or thereabouts. And of course, when he's done as president, he will say, well, Amy Jackson, he said, my two biggest mistakes were I should have shot Henry Clay and hung John C. Calhoun. <laughs> but some people say this is actually, some historians will say this is the start of the Civil War. And after John C. Calhoun dies in 1850, again, some of those gentlemen and others I mentioned, Robert Barnwell Rett, uh, William, William uh, Edwin Ruffin and William Lowndes Jancy uh, will make their case of, of this, for Southernism, this idea of preserving the South. However, at the same time, this, this preservation of the hierarchy of, of, the, of the plantation, you know, the plantations up here, and yet aren't there a lot, there are, more, there are more smaller farmers, yet are they exporting their goods? No. Who are, who are they selling their grain to? Who are they selling their livestock to? The plantations, they'll be paid for that, and the plantation owners export their cotton, tobacco, rice, so on and so forth. And so since the plantation owners are, seem to be the most well-endowed financially, who do you think rules the roost politically? The plantation owners. Again, going back to what some of those uh, historians will tell you, a southern aristocracy. And since most people are rural here, most of the people are rural. They're not urban. In fact, the beginning of the Civil War, Richmond's only going to have a population of 37,000 and change, you know. That's it. Wasn't that the capital of the Confederacy? Yeah. Mobile only has 29,000 people. That's it. Most of these people being farmers are rural. And as such, their worldly outlook is restricted to their locale. That's their nationalism. Now, are some all these white Southerners looking to preserve slavery? Maybe not as much as preserving this idea of their, of their Southern nationalism. It's interesting what you see here with the development of the, of the, of the South, because the Confederacy was a revolution. And so when they began to secede in 1860, you know, Robert, right, you know, uh, this guy Edmund Ruffin is interesting. He later became, a, I think he later became a, a, a lawyer, I think. But he was very much a, a, a loudspeaker for the Southern cause. And he will actually pull the first lanyard on the first shot fired for Fort Sumter. He was like 65, 67 years old. He got the honor of firing the first shot. Then there's somebody like Robert Barnwell Rett. Does that sound does that sound like a southern aristocracy type of name? Yeah. Yeah. His real name though was Smith. <laughs> <laughs> he 
He will later become, he will later become the, the editor of this Charles Plate, this periodical called the Charleston Mercury, very anti-North, very radical. William Lowndes Yancey, who well, I know was trained, I think was trained as a lawyer, but became a very he was the orator. He was one of the orators for Southernism. Was he a Supreme Court justice? No, I don't think William Lowndes Yancey was. Sounds like he would be with a name like that. <laughs> But he's very much at the forefront of pushing this southern, southernism. But the, a fascinating thing happens here. This is very radical. They're billing themselves, billing themselves as states rightists, the real defenders of the American Constitution. They really don't amend the Constitution that much, but they bill themselves as the real caretakers of the American Constitution. States' rights, so on and so forth. Yet it's interesting what happens here with the first Congress. Seven southern states are going to be followed by two more and four more eventually, the 11 southern states. But in the beginning here, uh, you know, as, as they form this so-called nation, all of a sudden it goes conservative. The idea of the southern radicalism, it almost dies at the convention in 1861. And this idea of this southern of this of this, this this southern aristocracy, yeah, they're going to preserve it, but the idea of states' rights is beginning to die right here. You know, this southern individualism, which southerners are known for, states' rights. States have have a right to do many things. However, here you're seeing central control, central government growing right off the bat. And what happens when the war starts? We need an army, right? Don't we need an army? Well, go back in American history. For the most part, up to this point, it's been the citizen-soldier concept. The idea here of a regular army was against the founding fathers. They thought a large standing army a threat to the republic. That's henceforth one of the reasons you have the Second Amendment, well-regulated militia, right of the citizen to bear arms shall not be infringed, which really doesn't exist anymore because the National Guard is not the well-regulated militia as entailed in the 1792 Militia Act. It's a bona fide reserve of the United States Army. So do we need to have a discussion on the Second Amendment? Yeah, I think we're overdue here. <laughs> Especially since in 1903, the National Guard Act overturned the Militia Act of 1792. I think we're a little late. <laughs> There's many things we're laid on. Yes? Weren't Washington and Hamilton trying to set up though a uh, national, you know, a more... There was, have, there was the idea of setting up a national citizen-soldier concept, but they didn't. They went to the governors to control them. So in the beginning, you had the regular, get this, the regular army of 2,630 men. They're going to defend 2.5 million people in 13 states? That's not going to work. No. What does it say in your Constitution? The president can federalize the militia if he needs them. For three months, though. Talk to, talk to National Guards in Afghanistan for a year. What happened to three months? They never changed the Constitution. But what you see is fascinating. So, yes, does that citizen-soldier concept work? Yes, but almost right off the bat here, this idea of states' rights, the rights of the individual, citizen-soldier concept being part of this. What are they doing? They're subsuming it in central government. They're going to have to build an army. And eventually, now note the manpower disadvantage here. 22 million people live up north, 9 million in the south. And of those 9 million, 3.5 million are black. So right off the bat, you're down to 5.5 million people. How's this going to work? Especially when the North is industrialized, as compared to the South. The South is an agrarian economy, and it's interesting here because by the time this war is over, by 1865, a nation of farmers is going to be starving. And yet, what's interesting here is some of these Confederate soldiers at the time of surrender will still be carrying 50, 60, 70, 70 bullets on them, yet they can't eat. What happened to a nation of farmers here? Herein lies the progression. Jefferson Davis knows. He knows what he's up against. They're fashioning this just like the American Revolution. Now, the American Revolution actually starts with the farmers, blacksmiths, and cobblers. The American insurgency, which we really don't teach too well here. It wasn't the con con Continental Army to start this, we start the war with. It's the people from Connecticut, 
Massachusetts, the Carolinas, who rise up spontaneously to first take on the loy loy loyalists and the Tories, then the British Army. So our revolution was a civil war first before it was a revolution. And I find that fascinating. How many people here have ever heard of Ride the Wooden Horse? The what? Ride the Wooden Horse. You have? Yeah. A fascinating, a fascinating scheme for motivational persuasion. I like to call it that. You know, we talk about Iran being a state sponsor of terrorism. Who, who the heck cares? Everybody does it anyway. Who cares? Go back to, go back to New England. You know those split, split rail fences that people have in their yards? Yeah. Okay, well, some of these patriots, and it was done vice versa, some of these patriots would take a loyalist or a Tory and lay them down on the top, the horizontal, top horizontal stringer here, and you tie them face down. You make sure their testicles are on the wood. And then what you do is you get two or three guys in each end doing this. Do that to somebody for 15, 20 minutes. And if you're the enterprising type, as is being bounced, you have somebody with a club. That's what New Englanders were doing. It's interesting. British, to the British? To loyalist Tories, sure. Colonists who didn't want to leave the crown. Of course, if you go up to Simsbury, you'll see the copper mines up there. That's where some of those people wound up 80, 80 feet deep in the ground working on copper mines. Uh, and anyway, so uh, if you want to get down to it, Americans were using uh, terrorist methods long before the Cubans, the Filipinos, and so on and so forth. So let's get over this. Everybody does it. But you see, yes. At the end of the ride, the wooden horse. Tar and yeah. In fact, they used to do that down south. In fact, they used to do that down south too when the, the boys would show up to a Tory plantation owner and say, hey, you're either with us or against us. And if you're against us, we're going to burn down your farm, or burn down your house, your barns. We're going to burn your cotton or tobacco, whatever it is you're growing. Oh, we're taking your Negroes. Then they would either run the poor side off this territory, tar or feather them, or occasionally show them. Is that terrorism? Yeah, of course it is. They don't teach that to the kids in the schools. How far that it go? But anyway, you see here down south this idea of southern individualism, the idea of states' rights dying in the beginning here. What they're, what they, what the, the premise supposedly for the Confederacy is on the downswing when the door opens up. A large standing army. Now, how is a how is a country of farmers? going to eventually support an army. Eventually it's going to grow to 875,000 men. How is this going to happen? And they're stretched. They're going to be stretched here. You can't shoot cotton. That's not how this works. So what are they going to do? You know, in the beginning it's fine. Jefferson Davis knows he can't launch, he can't launch concerted offensives. They don't have the army or the resources to take territory from the north. So what are they going to do? They're going to do. They're going to go through this. They're going to go with the same uh, rationale or same strategy George Washington used. Let them come to us, and we'll wear them out. That's what we're going to do. Wear them out. Kill a number of their soldiers. Make it unpopular back home. There's one problem with this. The British were 3,000 miles away. Where is the Northern Army? Next door. Not too far from the factories, the hospitals, the arsenals and the manpower pool. They don't need the Royal Navy to truck them all over the place. All they gotta do is march across the border. <laughs> so is this idea gonna work? No. However, you know, the North is gonna, it's gonna have to take time for the North to get their act together. 1861, 1862 are not examples of a war of movement. But of course, what's going to happen as the war goes on? The South is going to become a corporate socialist state. So much for, the, for, so much for states' rights. You actually begin to see this in 1862, when General George McClellan lands on the Virginia Peninsula. The idea here is, let's take Richmond now and end this. Well, you know, McClellan was quite a, he was no dumbbell. And he was quite open to new ideas. He was a younger general. And he was quite open to new ideas, like the Balloon Corps. This was the Army's first sojourn into air power here, folks. Thaddeus Lowe and the Balloon Corps. In fact, Thaddeus Lowe will prove the point 
on June 18, 1861, when he will ra rise up from the Columbia Armory, which is now the National Air and Space Museum, Washington, D.C., and instead of what the French were doing in the Great French War, you know, you make your observations, you write it on a, on, a, on a pad, you put the pad in a leather bag, run it down the static line, the people on the ground read it, they pen a reply, run it back up. No, it goes up with a telegraph in 1861. He will have two other men one of, with him, one of them a telegrapher. He will send a message dictated by law, and that message will go, number one, to a receiving station in Alexandria, Virginia, General Winfield Scott's headquarters, and to Abraham Lincoln at the White House. Abraham Lincoln will be the first head of state in world history to receive an air, air, um, uh, air communication, electronically fed communications from an aircraft to the ground. And yet, by 1863, the Northern Army will kill the idea of the Balloon Corps. They're still wet, they're still reactionary, they still don't grasp the concept. But McClellan did, the trouble with McClellan is, he was a plotter. But as he closes in on Richmond, you see this idea of, of, the, of, of, a, of, a, of a centralized control of the, of, the, of the Confederacy here in Richmond, March, April, 1862. And Jefferson Davis is going to pull out. He's going to leave a general named John Winder in charge who proclaims martial law. Complete antithesis to the Southern idea of individualism. But you're in a war. Centralized control is part of this. That's part of this. And what is he going to do? People going in and out of hotels have to have some sort of paperwork, like a passport. The trains, whoever comes in and comes out, strict recording. Food is going to be rationed. Oh, and by the way, people who own firearms have to report to the Ordnance Bureau. You go down to South Bay and tell some chitlins and cornbread, boy, you're going to take his gun and see, <laughs> how, see what happens here. But th this, this is the complete antithesis of this idea of states' rights. And also you're seeing uh, Josiah Gorgeous, who will be in charge of the Ordnance Bureau of the, of, the, of the Confederate government. Now this country starts without a true industrial capacity. This is a nation of farmers. And what's going to happen? Josiah, he's going to have, he's Josiah Gorgeous, who's in charge of the Ordnance Bureau, is going to take this, this, form, this, this, act, this part of the, Fed, the Confederate government and bring it from nothing to probably one of the best run operations in the Confederate government. Arsenals begin to pop up. Augusta, Lynchburg, Fayetteville, so on and so forth. Interesting what you're seeing here. In other words, they're industrializing. People are moving towards the city. Why? Because these cities, isn't that where many soldiers gravitate to? Aren't they communications and transportation hubs in the cities? Richmond, during the war, will go from 37,000 and change in population to over 80,000 by the end of the war. Mobile, 29,000 to 41, 42,000. All these cities are growing. What does that mean? Are people leaving the farms? Yes. Now, some of these are families maybe going to these, the closest city, maybe where the, the wife bringing the children, where her husband is stationed, so on and so forth. You know how that works. But you're seeing a wholesale change of the Confederacy. And as Mr. Gorgeous begins to build all these arsenals, it's interesting what you see happening. Take, for, take for instance, Selma, Alabama. By 1863, there are 3,000 people, many of them blacks, working in, this, working in this arsenal, an arsenal that didn't exist in 1860. And by 1865, upwards of 10,000 people are doing war work in Selma, Alabama. Vicksburg, the siege of Vicksburg, John Pemberton has 30, 35,000 troops here, besieged. Now, Mississippi, you know, was not was not a was not a industrial state. And yet by 1863, again disseminating production, they are making various towns near Vicksburg are making 10,000 uniforms a week. 200 hats a day. Shoes, maybe around 10,000 shoes was it on every week or every month. Who says a nation of farmers can't pull together here? 
And when and when and when leather or or, 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 or or rubber becomes a problem, as machine belts, they're doing things like taking cotton cloth, soaking them in linseed oil, and using them for machine belts. Interesting what people can do when they have to. The Southern Belle, remember her? Up here on the perch? Guess what's happening to some of them? <coughs> Coming off that perch and going to work. Does this sound like later Rosie the Riveter? Yeah. World War I, more specifically, World War II? Mm -hmm. So what you're seeing here is the rudiments of this rudimentary military industrial complex that the South must need to erect to fight a conventional war. A conventional war they're up against it, especially by 1863 after, after Gettysburg. I, who do you think is going to win this war? You know, and, and then who's going to take over? Grant, Sherman, Phil Sheridan. I mean, these are generals that know how to wield troops in a conventional manner because the war has gone on too long for the South. And Grant knows he has the manpower. He has the northern industrial capacity. The South will, will, will start conscription in 1862, April 16, 1862. Conscription. They do it before the North does. They had just had a uh, service not long ago over at, I go to the American Legion Post the first Sunday of every month. They, they have a wonderful ceremony there. It doesn't last long. If you have a, a deceased relative who was a veteran, they will remember that relative for you. Didn't have to be an American Legion member, did not have to be a VFW member. All you have to do is have the paperwork, you know, DD 214, so on and so forth. You know, dis discharge paperwork. And they will remember that, that your, your, your relative. And what they'll do is take the family flag from you and they'll fly it for the month. And then the following month, when it's the turn of the next family, they have a nice little ceremony where they will lower your flag with a ceremony returning to you, folded. You know, as, as they, those flags are folded, they have an honor guard that will fold the flag, return it to you, and then the sergeant at arms goes to the family next to you, takes their flag, and runs it up. That's a nice, I go there every month. Every month I go there. It's, it's, it's wonderful to see. But you see here with these, it's, it's interesting when you talk to these soldiers about this. I mean, they, some of them are really touched by it. I think it's a wonderful ceremony. American Legion Post 12 on, uh, on County Street in Norwalk, first Sunday of every month. Of course, when they do it in December, they'll remember a family member, but they always, every year, uh, year in, year out, remember the 17 Connecticut War dead at Pearl Harbor. And they have a bell from one of the ships, and every time they read the name, ding, goes a bell. So they, they, it's very tastefully done. It really is. Very tastefully done. But this idea of, of the northern armies, you know, it's interesting because one of the ceremonies here was for this fellow I know who was a fireman. He had a relative who was in the American Civil War. And back then, he was in the war 1861-1863. If you were drafted, if you could come up with 300 bucks, you can get out of the draft. And... Mr. Uh, Mr. Ed, Ed Isaac's uh, uh, relative, uh, this one guy got drafted. He wanted out, so he told he told Ed Isaac's relative. He says, "Well, I'll tell you what. I'll give you the three hundred dollars. Will you go in for me?" Yeah, okay. So this guy pockets the three hundred dollars and goes back into the Union Army. He was there from 1864-65. The guy saw quite a bit of action, by the way. He survives, survives with three hundred extra dollars in his pocket. What a country. But you see, that, that again, that the South is up against it. You know, they're fighting against an economic monolith is what they're doing here. And this military industrial complex translate, tra helping to translate into a corporate social state because of centralized control, the idea of preserving states' rights and southernism is dead. And the southern aristocracy will die here. Of course, this is, you're seeing the rudiments of, of an industrialized South being born here. It's also going to spell the end of slavery. The object of the exercise here is to show that when people want to build a certain society and you get involved in a large war, it irrevocably alters society. 
go back to George Washington's farewell address when he said, beware of entangling alliances. He wasn't warning about business deals. He wasn't warning about opening up embassies in other countries. He was warning about having alliances with other countries militarily. Perhaps the country in question here at that time would have been France. Doesn't the president have to go before Congress and ask for a declaration of war? Yes. The president just can't send the troops to war. Well, at least he wasn't supposed to. George Washington's fear was that an alliance with another country militarily will undermine the Constitution and Bill of Rights. That's what he was, he wasn't the only one. Because keep in mind here, you know, this idea, and in fact, Grant and Sherman, practitioners of this, you see in 1864, why would we want to fight these huge battles for? Okay, so General Grant is going to under, undertake, a, undertake a strategy where he'll tie down Robert E. Lee's Army of Northern Virginia, and what is Mr. Sherman going to do? He's going to go from one end of the Confederacy to the other. Economic warfare. They understand that the South is trying to build this military industrial complex to keep the war going. Well, that's ended. He's going to go on a 60 mile wide path of destruction, ripping up the railroad tracks, burning the rolling stock, burning the cotton, burning the farm, or, or, ta or taking the food. Whatever they can't take, they destroy it. From one end of the Confederacy to the other. This is economic warfare. Why? Because it's spurred on by modernity. As man evolves, it's indu you know, this industrial revolution evolved, it's changing war. We're not just destroying an army, we are destroying an economy. Russell Weagley, a noted historian, will later say, when he looks back and analyzes what Grant and Sherman did to the South, 1864-1865, and then goes into, then, then researches what the Allies did in World War II with the B-17, B-24, Lancaster, Halifaxes, U.S. 8th Army Air Force and the British Bomber Command bombing Germany. They said that, he said this is just an improvement over what Grant and Sherman did with men uh, walking or on horseback. Is he correct? I think he is. The equipment has changed. The basic idea is the same economic war. As capitalism has evolved, as the Industrial Revolution evolved, it evolved, it changes war to this extent. Let's destroy the enemy's capability to wage war. That's what you saw Grant and Sherman do. This is called total war in the modern sense. That's what this is. And when you look at the South, what's striking about this, what's absolutely striking, is that they are really the only Americans who understood total war. Why? They're on the receiving end of it. The closest you'll get otherwise is talk to a, uh, well, they're older now, talk to a Marine who was on Iwo Jima or Okinawa. Talk to a guy who got stuck in the Battle of the Bulge. Talk to another GA who got stuck in that hellhole known as the Pusan Perimeter in Korea. Those are the only Americans who really know. Very few Americans today know total war. Oh yeah, talk to a Russian. <laughs> talk to a Pole. Talk to a Chinese. I'm talking these older people who went through World War II. Brother, they'll tell you total war. They'll tell you stories that make your hair curl. Americans have no clue of this kind of war. The Southerners did. And when the war is over, they've lost their country. Their government is gone. Their army has been defeated. Their economy is a shambles. Their occupied future bleak. The only Americans who really understood total war because they were on the receiving end of it. And this idea of the Southern aristocracy. I find this concept fascinating because it's a backward idea to begin with. From the get-go, it's a backward idea. Since the French Revolution and the ideas of the age, American Revolution, the ideas of the age of reason, age of enlightenment, we are seeing enlightened thinking, this idea of a southern aristocracy. What are you kidding? The monarchs are dying here. And, and the Civil War is emblematic of this. Modern war, modern technology, huge armies. Is it a mirror of what's going to happen to the European monarchs in 1919? Yes, the day is coming for them in a war that's going to be a lot larger. Why? Because the Industrial Revolution has had another 50 years to progress. 
They didn't have fixed wing aircraft in the Civil War. Yeah, you had one submarine, but <laughs> that, was, that was limited. You didn't, have, you didn't have the wide use of poison gas. The Gatling gun comes out here, but the machine gun as it was in World War I. And again, you see the technology, the rail gun. Now, I'm sure you've seen pictures of these huge rail guns in World War I. Well, they began that in the Civil War. It made sense. Put artillery on a railroad car, and we'll run it to where we have to go. Makes sense. Mobility is what that's called. So modernity is seen here in the American Civil War. I know we usually don't look at the Confederacy this way, but we must. This idea, this idea of states' rights, the, the vaunted Southern idea of the individual, uh, the Southern aristocracy, is killed in the Civil War because of what? Centralized control of government. You have to have centralized control if you're going to fight a war like this. Rationing. You honestly think these people liked rationing? And it's interesting, too, because wasn't the Southern currency a weak currency? You've heard those jokes. No, it's Confederate money. <laughs> so if people weren't paying their taxes or the currency is weak, how do you think was, how do you think was another method that the Southern, Southern government was going to make sure that the Southern army was equipped? In other words, could eat. The requisition squads go out to the farms, take a certain percentage of the grain, a certain percentage of the livestock, Army, an army is, a, army is a group of consumers. Does it really produce anything? No, but it eats a lot. It eats a lot. Again, is an army an example of centralized government? Yes, it is. Yes, it is. And if you're fighting war on this level, does that impact the economy? Yes. And that's what you're seeing here. The North, this idea of getting back again to a small standing army bolstered by a militia. Citizen militia, guys 18 to 45, and they buy their own guns according to the Militia Act of 1792. Washington doesn't do this. And yet, you can see where history is going to go here because by April 9, 1865, the Northern Army will be 2,213,000 men. It is the largest armed force in the history of North America up to this point. And it's not a bad army, folks. It's not a bad army. Of course, some of the European liaison officers who come here to watch this, all oh, these guys are just a couple of, a bunch of uh, armed mobs. Uh, I kind of disagree with that. Although truth be told, Grant would take losses. He used to get criticized for this from some members of Congress, you know. <coughs> He takes losses. Lincoln's reply, yeah, but he wins. I always thought Grant would have made a, a, a pretty good Soviet general. <laughs> he would have fit in pretty, in that regard, fit in pretty well with Stalin. Even drank. <laughs> now, and I think if, if Grant had been around in World War II, they'd have fired him. If you remember the incident with Patton on Sicily, the slapping incidents, what happened to him? Didn't he get disciplined? Yeah. 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 So I think Mr. Grant wouldn't have made World War II. Probably would have gave him a job home. How, how, how some characters in certain, in certain eras of history might not have been able to function in another era because of the change in the climate, political climate. It's in, I find that concept fascinating. But was he the man for the hour? Probably. Probably. But you see here the rudiments of what's going to happen down the road. This idea of a military industrial complex conscripting entire people and economies for war. And does it exhaust those economies? Yes, it does. Yes. Yes, it does. I mean, you can even go back to see. Uh, without really a mil modern military industrial complex, the Hundred Years War, not the one in Europe, I'm talking the one in the Middle East. You go back to the 16th and 17th centuries where the Ottoman Turks and the Safavid Persians fought on and off for over a hundred years to control Mesopotamia. 
and Murad IV, the Sultan of the Ottoman Empire, will finally win it. But when you get to the 18th century, the 19th century, the Ottoman Empire, if you fight for a long time, weakens, it weakens your economy and your society. And that's when you're going to see the British and the French begin to pick apart the Ottoman Empire. Interesting what you see here. Absolutely fascinating. Anybody have any questions? Or any comments? Yes? I was, just, I was just thinking maybe you could answer it. Um, if you were an industrialist in the north and you ran a factory or a coal mine or built ships or something, you could make money. Right? Mm -hmm. Ford made money in the World War. And Electric boat makes money today, mm -hmm. and uh, maybe anyway. Uh, um, but you know, you get the idea. There, right. was, a, there was a profit in mm -hmm. war, and I guess the North had the money to to pay for that. Controlling the banks, and I can't think of the equivalent in the South. Or is that? Or am I no, they're starting from scratch. They're starting from scratch. Kind of late in the game to start from scratch here. But you need an aristocracy where there was a profit in it for them. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and they have so. right. It's not again. Again, they are way behind the curve here. You know, it's almost like nobody thought about this when they decided to secede. And all of a sudden, now uh, it's like the reality rams home. This these firebrands of, of southernism. Now it becomes a conservative agenda. Uh oh, the reality is setting in here. And I mean, do you think Mr. Lincoln is going to let this stand? Although I think it was William Seward. That when the southern when the southern states began to secede, I think it was him. He mentioned he made a comment. He says, "Well, at least we're rid of those mosquito republics." <laughs> now I'm sure that Mr. Lincoln didn't didn't appreciate that. No, I want this country whole, and I'm going to do what I have to do to keep it whole. And what I find fascinating politically out of all of this is Tsarist Russia. They did not want the South, they didn't want the South to win. They were big boosters of Abraham Lincoln. Hey, you know, hey, Abe, you got to win this. They wanted this country to stay together. And the question is, well, why would, why would they care? Simple, they lost the Crimean War to the British, the French, and the Ottomans. So maybe the United States can be an ally in the future? Abe, you got to win this. Don't let your country fall apart. Interesting what you see when you step back and look at what, how outsiders see this. Keep in mind at the same time what's going on in Mexico. Didn't the French have an army down there? Didn't that violate the Monroe Doctrine? There's not much Lincoln can do about this if he's fighting the Confederacy. However, when he's gone, Andrew Johnson's president will send 50,000 Union troops down to the Texas border, commanded by Phil Sheridan. There was a chance that France and the United States would go to war. Doesn't happen. Because again, events in Europe where Otto von Bismarck will finish the uniting of the German state. And Napoleon III understands that, uh oh, <laughs> uh, that game's changed in Europe, so he's going to pull all the troops out. And he's going to leave Maximilian there. You know what's going to happen to Maximilian by 1867. Yeah, that's it. Now he's done. And so, you know, uh, the Monroe Doctrine in that fashion is preserved, I guess if you want to say that. But again, uh, what happens after the war is fascinating. The United States is going the Union. The United States is going to demobilize. Again, many of the found, many of the Congress, many in Congress still believed in what the founding fathers stated that a large standing army is a threat to the Grand Republic. And what's going to happen here? Well, two million two hundred thirteen thousand men on April 9, 1865. There's going to be no more than fifty-seven thousand men by September 1867. And by 1874, the army's down to 26, 26,000 and change, and that's it. The Navy started with 42, 43 combat ships in 1860-61. They will have 674 ships by 1865. 63 of them will be iron or steel. You know, that day is coming. And yet, by 1868, 69, back down to 43 ships. Now, this is not demobilization. They emasculated the defense establishment. But next week when we come back, I'm going to go into how and why that changed. I'm going to go into how we were unprepared for the First World War, but the rudiments are there with Mr. Franklin D. Roosevelt. And how Mr. Stalin will understand 
that though Russia was not ready in 1914, it will be ready the next time. And it's fascinating what you see here. The two countries that will win that war in 1945 have these very large military industrial complexes and centralized government. It's, fascin it's a fascinating progression to see. It really is. Anybody else have any questions? Yes, sir. Briefly mentioned the banking. Uh, what's the banking system role and the currency, that kind of thing? Of, of bond issues, that type of thing back in the Civil War era? Well, you had, you know, you had the banks up north, the U.S. dollar. That was sound for the most part. But the Confederate, standard, I guess. beg your pardon? Gold standard, if I remember right. Yes, and what you're seeing, but with the South, it's a fiat currency. And so, you know, do people want to spend a fiat currency? What happens with inflation here? Inflation at one point goes out of control. So what are you going to, so what are you going to do to, to, to circumvent that? Especially when some Southerners can't afford to pay taxes. Well, now the collection squads go out. I'm going to take so much grain. I'm going to take so much, so much livestock. The army has to eat, whether the currency's strong or not. So does this help? You know, does this help? Uh, is this a debilitation for the for the southern economy? Yes. In fact, Mr. Stalin. I'll get into this more next week. Mr. Stalin, when he begins to collectivize the Soviet Union, 1928, 1927, 28 because he's going to industrialize the Soviet Union. He doesn't wait for a war. He sends the NKVD out bef long before the, the, next, the next chapter of the war starts. And what is he doing? Taking a certain percentage of the grain and the livestock of the peasants. And he's going to take a higher percentage than the, than the, the Confederates were taking, I think, like 10, 15 percent. Stalin, 35, 40 percent of the grain and livestock. Of course, it's as different in a certain respect that Mr. Stalin's going to export some of this grain and livestock for hard currency to build more factories. But that's, that's manipulating the economy too to get what you want. But again, these large, uh, you know, these large, these military industrial complexes, they do suck the lifeblood out of, an account, out of, out of a country. And then that, you, know, you have to ask the question, is, in fact, I was at a meeting a week and a half ago. You know, Himes is running for re-election, right? And this one young lady, I have at North Community College, boy, oh boy, right out of the starting gate. Hey, Jim, I'm getting sick and tired of the military industrial complex. I, we spent all this money, and I'm not getting my money's worth. Whoa. <laughs> and he says, well, as long as, as long as people want to stay on the world stage, you know, you're stuck with it. Interesting. Um, Interesting. Would it yeah. be fair to say that uh, because the South lost uh, the Civil War, then it took until when, 1939 to 45, uh, uh, what I would call World War II, for the great industrialization of the South to occur? Could you just address that? Yeah, when, when, you know, when the um, war is over, and in 1865, America had around 144,000 factories or, or production facilities. By the end of the century, uh, 335,000. Some of those will be in the South. So you're seeing this rebound of the South now uh, as, as they're weaning themselves off this farm economy and going to industrialization. Although keep in mind, by 1900, 50% of Americans are still farmers. You're not going to kill that right away. Uh, but that day is coming. And yes, uh, in fact, if you look at the evolution of how this has progressed, where are, where are many of your military bases today? South. Fort Benning, Fort right. Rucker. Yeah, right? Mm -hmm. How many military bases up here in the north anymore? South has the land. That's it. You know, so, yeah, I mean, t talk to a lot of World War II vets from up here who, where'd you go? Uh, I went to Benning, I went to here, I went to Benning. Well, down, well, you know, down south. Well, this was down south. Texas. Texas, right, yeah. Interesting what you see here. It's absolutely fascinating. So that's part of the change in the country. Well, you mentioned the population difference at the start of the war. Mm -hmm. I'm aware of the population surge from the revolutions of the 48 and the 50s and the Irish famine at that end. With the South being blockaded, what, if any, influence with the immigration during that period? I mean, you know about the draft riots in New York, but right. were they getting a lot of immigration during that time? Yeah, it's interesting. When, when, when you begin to cherry pick the Northern Army, upwards of 20% of the, 
of the northern soldiers were Irish or German. And, yeah, quite a few of them. But didn't they come earlier, or were they yes. coming during this time? Now, some of them came during this time. But you had the, the all the revolutions of 48 and 50 and the Irish famine. Really right. Happened. Yeah, the springtime of nations in 1848. So you began yeah. to see right. more of an influx coming here. But some of these people flocked to join the country they now lived in. And what's fascinating about that, you know this idea of American individualism, people, Americans don't like being told what to do. However, you get to some of, these, some of these Irish or these Germans from the other side, they came from societies where you were told what to do. Did the northern commanders like these guys? Oh yeah. How about black slaves? You know, you really didn't have much in the way of black soldiers down south, God forbid. However, upwards of 180,000 slave black men are going to serve in the Northern Army. Now, are these people who know, know, know how to operate when being told what to do? Yeah. So it's interesting what you see here, the difference between these armies. And the South is going to undergo the same sort of thing that the Nazis later will when people like Reinhard Galen of the German Intelligence Service on the Eastern Front was telling Berlin, hey, we got a lot of people here who do not want to live under Stalin. Why don't we recruit them? Germans fight with Slavs? Hmm. The degenerate Slav? <laughs> Although some, some will. Uh, you know, when the Germans were surrounded at Stalingrad, uh, many were German soldiers, also Italians, Romanians, Croatians and some Russian volunteers were caught in that net too. I don't have to tell you what the Ger Russians probably did with Russian volunteers to the Ger for the Germans. But if you go to Normandy, uh, you know, when the Allies hit the beaches, some of the channel defenses were manned by Ukrainians and Cossacks. And again, I don't have to tell you what happened when they were returned home to Stalin's tender mercies. So it's interesting what you see here. We're going back to immigrants and things of this nature. But then again, and I'll mention this next week, you know, when you get to the First World War, countries like France and England, when they have a manpower shortage, who do they get? People from their colonies? You think that makes these people in these colonies happy? What are we getting out of this? I'm not a member of the firm. What am I getting out of this? So it's interesting what you see here. People who willingly join, and people who go kicking and screaming. And again, that's all part of this progression that's going to alter some of these societies. And that's one, that's one aspect of this that's going to bring on, I'll get into this next week, that brings, in, this brings into the, 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 the reality here this idea of revolutionary nationalism, which you're going to see in Asia, Africa, and the Middle East. It's fascinating how, how, how total war slash military industrial complexes are changing these countries. It's absolutely astounding. But again, this is what I like to call the commercialization of war. That's what's happened here. It's a commercialization of war. You know, especially as these countries like the British, the French, Tsarist, Russia, Germany's gonna come on, it's gonna come on the scene here. Uh, they are looking for colonies. This is the closing stages of the golden age of imperialism. Japan will jump into this race as will we. And I'll get into that next week. Anybody else have any questions? Or comments? Now we're done.